Well, welcome back. Apparently when I do the live stream, it's when it pops up. So I'm able to record it on desktop, thank goodness. But anyway, starting with the, would you survive an earthquake? Um, so, I just tap it, yep, there we go. So in the video, disclaimers, what are earthquakes, earthquake terms, types of earthquakes, where they occur, their risks, the myths, facts, theories, and controversies. Um, also, um, what to do in an earthquake, after an earthquake, prep and proofing, other survival tips, and then the end. Um, disclaimers. Sadly, it's not going to be streamed. It will be premiered, though, because Google decided it'd be a pain and not allow me to stream it. Anyways, any photos in this video are protected under fair use in purpose of education. This video will likely be a long one, so hope you brought a snack. We'll be blunt on some of the topics, so if you get offended, easily tune out of the video now, or when you start to feel uncomfortable. I promise it won't be salty when you leave. And please don't go off on the comments on how this offended you, as that solves nothing. If you are, if you seen this in, as you've seen in the in this video slide. I'll be covering controversies and theories including earthquake forecasting and lunar effects on earthquakes. Now for the most of this is pseudoscience and others it is pure science and I will do my best to be objective and not subjective on either side. You can express your opinions just don't be rude about it. Those of you who stayed you have been warned and get ready to be educated, edumacated or whatever that people want to call it. So earthquakes is what occurs when a fault line or plate boundary releases stress causing the ground to shake, crack, or even liquefy. Keep in mind this only applies to Earth. On other worlds you would add the other names like Mars quakes on Mars. Um, road that was destroyed after an earthquake likely in the 6th range, not sure on location. Um, continuing on. Earthquake terms. This segment I'll be covering the terms and lingo that involves in earthquakes like epicenter, waves, etc. Starting with the epicenter, um, which is where the earthquake occurred on the surface. Um, you don't need to be in the epicenter to feel the earthquake or experience its effects, but those in the epicenter usually see the worst that the earthquake has to offer. Uh, this would be how an epicenter would look on a map. Uh, this appears to be the earthquake that struck Haiti in 2010. The hypercenter would be, or focus, would be where the earthquake occurred on the surface and how far deep it happened. Um, if the epicenter is deep enough, you won't feel a thing. Um, P waves would be the first waves that come in after an earthquake. I don't know why I autocorrected to AND, but AN earthquake and are usually weaker and often go off unnoticed. P waves would be the would be where the ground moves back and forth or compress and contract. Um, S waves, the second wave after the earthquake, tend to be more noticeable and more damaging than P waves, cause the ground to move up and down. Surface waves are the third wave and that comes with the earthquake, tends to be the most visible as it appears on the surface can go up side to side or up and down um, types of earthquakes I didn't realize how dark this was anyways segments will be covering the types that are caused by plate boundaries fault lines man-made volcanic and the ranges um, I'm not sure if I actually cover the ranges um, anyways plate boundaries uh, earthquakes the plate boundary earthquakes are the most common and tend to occur depending strong tend to be the strongest depending on the type of plate boundary they occur on. We'll be going into more detail on the different plate boundaries in future slides. Uh, the plate and then the plate boundary map probably outdated, but it's the best I could come up with. Um, subduction zone uh, where the plates well one plate goes under another. Um, tend to be the most dangerous as they are, tend to be the strongest and can cause tsunamis can also be an indicator for volcanic activity 
most of the earthquakes, if not all, above a 9.0 come from subduction boundaries. The most infamous subduction boundary would be the Cascadian subduction zone off the coast of, Was of Washington and Oregon in the U.S., where the Wanda Fuca plate goes under the North American, which will be featured in the next slide. There we go. And it's very dangerous, mostly because the volcanoes um, transform would be where the plates go past each other, like cars on a road. Uh, the earthquakes tend to be weaker than subduction boundaries, but some can go up to the 8, range, eight magnitude range. These earthquakes do not typically cause tsunamis and volcanoes, and are not and volcanoes are not common with this type of boundary. Most infamous example would be the San Andreas Fault in California. Which, well, there you go. Uh, Parkfield, yeah, that's very nasty fault. Um, divergent boundaries or rift zones are where the plate boundaries move away from each other. Earthquakes that occur at these boundaries usually are weaker compared to subduction and transform boundaries and pose almost no tsunami risk if they occur in the water. Volcanoes are also common with these boundaries. Great example would be Iceland. There we go. Sorry if this is a bit cringy, but it would have been more cringy for the stream, not gonna lie. Uh, so, hotspots, weak points in the earth where volcanoes tend to form, and well, and with volcanoes come earthquakes. Hotspots are usually nowhere near plate boundaries. Most Earthquakes and hotspot zones are linked with to volcanic activity, meaning uh, meaning earthquakes tend to lead to quakes. Uh, well, meaning earthquakes tend to lead to eruptions, and the very least, at the very least, shows that magma is moving inside of the volcanoes. Keep in mind, it usually takes an earthquake of a five or higher to cause an eruption. Prime example would be Hawaii, which you will see in the next slide. That tends to be how that works. And there's also Lohi, uh, Lohihi, just off the coast of Kilauea. That is also part of the hotspot. And the earthquakes can get nasty. There was a 6.9 in 2018. Many of you guys may have known that one. Uh, inner, plate fault, uh, inner plate fault lines. Um, Fault lines that do not correspond with the plate boundary. Earthquakes caused by these faults tend to be deeper and weaker in some cases, while stronger and more shallow in others. There are different. They, these are different from hotspots, as there's almost never any volcanoes. Prime example would be the New Madrid seismic zone in the Midwest of the U.S. And that's what it would be. New Madrid seismic zone and the Wabash Valley seismic zone. Um, all part of the same fault system. Volcanic earthquakes um, usually occur on, around, on and under volcanoes, usually a sign of magma moving inside the volcano when they are small. Larger earthquakes or huge, earth, larger or huge, well, larger earthquakes or huge earthquake swarms can be a sign of impending eruptions. Prime example would be the 6.9 earthquake in Leilani Springs, Hawaii, in 2018. Like I mentioned earlier, with the hotspots which led to the fissures opening up and spewing lo lava all over the region. So, man-made earthquakes. Next few slides, I will be talking about the main man, main ways ca man can cause earthquakes. Big one, starting off um, with fracking or drilling induced earthquakes usually uh, occur when an oil pump drills into the ground to extract oil, usually by flushing water into the ground, bringing out the oil and disturbing dormant fault lines. These earthquakes usually are a weak, ranging in the 1 to 3 magnitude range, but occasionally can be large. Modern water wells may also trigger earthquakes in this fashion. Um, prime example would be the 5.7 earthquake in Prague, Oklahoma in 2011. There we go. And then dams and reservoirs. Dams can trigger earthquakes as they create lakes called reservoirs, adding pressure to the land, creating cracks and fissures. It's like an old house settling. Um, again, these earthquakes tend to be weaker, but occasionally can okay, have gotten large. These earthquakes can also trigger small tsunamis in the reservoir that cause the earthquake and can even break the dam. Prime example would be the 1996 Thompson, Victoria 
Australia earthquake with a 5.0. Couldn't find any images, sadly. Um, mining. Mining resources like metal and certain rocks can trigger earthquakes from either mine collapse or the explosives using in, used in mining. Uh, Mining-induced earthquakes tend to be small and rarely go above 4 range, but doesn't mean that they can't be strong. prime example would be the 1989 5.6 magnitude Newcastle, Australia earthquake, which has killed 13 people. So, Geothermal plants should come at no surprise. Geothermal plants can trigger earthquakes, as you're literally drilling into geologically active ground to, to extract the Earth's, Earth's internal heat for electricity. Earthquakes tend to be weak, but ha but a few have gotten strong. Um, there's also a theory that ge geothermal plants may trigger volcanic activity, but nothing of that nature has occurred yet. Um, prime example would be the ge uh, geothermal plant-induced earthquake was the 5.5 magnitude in South Korea in 2017. Extraterrestrial quakes... Uh, would be the earthquakes that don't happen on Earth, like Mars quakes on Mars, or Venus quakes on Venus, etc. Um, I forgot to go over the magnitude ranges, but Aussie should have. I completely forgot about that, so I do apologize. But where earthquakes occur... Um, um, but yeah, from most likely to least likely, there's an earthquake risk map. Um, let's see... Main hotspots will be West Coast, Hawaii, also, surpri well, surprisingly, South Carolina, and then there's the New Madrid fault zone, they are the main ones. Earthquake risks, um, falling buildings, collab well, falling objects, buildings, bridges, and shattering glass. The shaking of these earthquakes are known to cause loose objects to topple over, unstable buildings and bridges to collapse, and glass to shatter. The hazard tends to cause the most injuries and deaths, especially with the collapsing buildings, bridges, and shattering glass. Keep in mind this hazard is more common in areas of poor infrastructure. Um, so it'll be important to keep tabs of the infrastructure. I don't know how to go back. There we go. That works. Um, Sinkholes and fissures. Earthquakes are known to cause the ground to open up with fissures and sinkholes, and it's very unpredictable on where those holes, these holes will open up. Although most of these holes are small and don't do much. Uh, the sinkholes, on, well, most of these holes, which are usually fissures, are small and don't do much. But the sinkholes, on the other hand, can become large enough to swallow cars and buildings. And again, as mentioned earlier, fissures can trigger, can be tied to volcanic activity and could lead to uh, eruptions or even create new, new volcanoes. Um, then liquefaction is where the ground liquefies during an earthquake, most common with limestone and saturated s soils. Ground becomes like quicksand where anything on the ground will start to sink, can also lead to sinkholes and maybe fissures. Um, landslides and avalanches. Earthquakes can cause landslides with loose hillsides and avalanches with loose snow and glaciers usually are quite dangerous and can bury and destroy anything in, it, in their path. Prime example would be this lands, the landslide that started the May 18, 1980 Mount St. Helens eruption. Uh, tsunamis. Earthquakes in and near any um, body of water can has the potential to trigger tsunamis. Tsunamis usually are triggered with the, when the certain tr criteria has been met. Usually, no, met though. Usually, being an earthquake above a seven magnitude range, hits in the in the subduction zone. How to tell if an earthquake is coming is when the tide ret retreats farther and faster than usual. Like there's obviously the tides with the moon, but if it's faster than what the moon normally does then there's a chance that tsunamis coming. A prime example would be the 2011 Japanese tsunami, which was triggered by a 9.0 magnitude earthquake on a subduction zone. Rip currents, a bit more controversial, but, but there is also probability that earthquakes can cause, a possibility that earthquakes can cause rip currents, similar to how they trigger tsunamis. Now, with rip currents, it also would 
vet would would have to question if the threshold to cause a rip currents would be less than what causes a tsunami and the volcanic and geyser eruptions earthquakes can lead to volcanic eruptions and sometimes geyser eruptions as volcanic induced earthquakes are often signs of moving magma same as can be said with geysers with magma and water and if and when the earthquakes get large enough it can trigger the volcano or geyser to wake up and erupt um, again prime examples would be the 6.9 in um, Hawaii which triggered the Kilauea to rupture a lot and over a wide area with fissures and then the 5.7 and that triggered the Mount St. Helens eruption um, anyways the earthquakes myths theories and controversies and facts uh, this segment I'll be covering many myths facts theories and controversies involving in earthquakes these myths facts theories and controversies may include earthquake forecasting which may or may not uh, and what may or may not influence earthquakes se seismic activity also some wise tales that involve in earthquakes sadly no one submitted any wise tales and they didn't know of any so there won't be that um, there also would include more controversial risks with earthquakes um, so earthquake forecasting uh, would be the art of or science of predicting earthquakes this would be the, on the more controversial side as the main science agencies like the USGS and NASA say it is currently impossible to do so while many folks on YouTube and other sources many of you may already know claim it is possible the current known strategies to use used to predict earthquakes will be featured in future slides solar activity one earthquake forecasting theory is tracking solar activity. The belief is that the corona holes or holes in the magnetic field of the sun can lead to larger earthquakes when facing the earth. Earthquake patterns. Um, yeah, main believer for that last one would be that suspicious observer's guy. Uh, I forget his name. Um, anyways, earthquake patterns. Another theory is that earthquakes travel around the globe like a storm or a jet stream. This theory also claims that earthquakes have a tendency to stay on certain paths. Uh, Piers, a main believer on that one, would be Dutch sense, but I'm pretty sure there's other factors with that. Um, tidal forces. Another theory is that tidal forces may have an effect on earthquakes. This I have noticed as well, with the larger earthquakes having a tendency to hit around the full and new moons. Um, so, yeah, like... Honestly, look up any large earthquake that's like above a six, seven, eight, or nine, and odds are there's it, it was like within a day or two of a full moon or a new moon. Like honestly, um, there's another one I forgot to mention. Um, that deeper earthquakes tend to lead to shallow or larger earthquakes. I wasn't able to do much research on that one, otherwise I would have included it. Um, anyways, earthquakes can cause heart attacks and seizures. And seizures. There's a theory that earthquakes can cause heart attacks and seizures. Um, heart attack for heart attacks. Earthquakes can trigger emotional and physical stress for those with acute coronary syndromes, which in turn can lead to heart attacks. For seizures, earthquakes cause shaking, which in turn can cause the body to shake, and in turn can trigger seizures. These are most common with disorders like epilepsy and, and NES. Seizures tend to act like earthquakes as well. Um, both earthquake-induced heart attacks and seizures tend to be more common with aftershock swarms that are followed by large main shock. Main shock. It is advised for those with conditions that make them more vulnerable to heart attacks and seizures to avoid earthquake-prone areas. And I do repeat this um, later on in the um, thing. Um, anyways, what to do in an earthquake? Uh, we'll be going what to do in an earthquake to survive it going through the main three scenarios when it comes to earthquakes indoors outdoors in a car um, so indoors when earthquakes when an earthquake well when indoors during an earthquake you want to get under something sturdy like a desk table or even a bed if at all possible um, it is poss if at all possible put something on your head like a helmet or a sturdy hat to soften any blows stay still in this in that safe spot until protecting head and body until all shaking stops when outside, you'll want to go um, 
away from any buildings, poles, power lines, and trees that may fall on you. Also try to avoid muddy areas as that may liquefy if not open up as sinkholes. Um, and that one's a bit more controversial, but it would be best advice. <laughs> um, anyways, in a car, when driving, you may not notice the shaking at all until you see damage actually occurring and people running. When that occurs, just avoid such damage and people or even pull over somewhere safe and you should be fine. When in a parked car, you will notice as the car will start bouncing. Just pull away from anything that may fall on you, then park again and wait for the shaking to stop. Um, and what, what to do after an earthquake will be same scenarios, but there we go. When indoors, you will want to shut off all utilities, water, gas, and electric to prevent flooding and fires and explosions. When evac then evacuate the building in case of collapse. If needed, evacuate the city region or area in case of explosions and especially if you're on the coast in case of tsunamis. You may have to camp outside for a few days in case of aftershocks. If you're trapped, dial 911 or use life alert if you have it. Scream for help, but try to conserve oxygen if you don't feel a draft. As, you know, if you're trapped, but if you feel a draft, there's a way for air to come in, so you should be fine. And don't have to worry about uh, suffocating, but if you don't feel a draft, then it's completely airtight, and you would be limited on oxygen. Um... But anyway, well, also if you feel a draft, there may be a way for you to get out. Um, anyways, if outside, not much is needed to do, depending on where you are at. If nowhere near buildings or anything flammable or the possibility of flooding, should be safe where you are at. If near a water, if near the water of like a large lake or the ocean, you will want to go as far inland as possible to avoid tsunamis. If near the mountains, you may want to evacuate away in case of avalanches and, well, and slash or avalanches. Same would be with volcanoes in case of eruptions. Avoid down power lines and also, if at all, foil, if, if at all possible, avoid um, wet spots, muddy areas, as that could be quicksand. And if you happen to be stuck in quicksand, just uh, spread, spread out your body as much as you can and remain calm. As it just works as a li liquid, it just it just to displace the weight that you put in. So the more spread out you are, the less you'll sink. Um, well, in the car, it'll be the same as if you were outdoors. And with the flooding, turn around, don't drown. Um, so from there, earthquake prep and proofing. We'll be going over tips to help minimize damage and injury from earthquakes. This will more or less be a list versus multiple slides. Even though the list will end up being multiple slides anyways. So tips are earthquake proofing, bolt down furniture and appliances to the ground and walls to keep them in place and less likely to fall over. Put child safety locks on cupboards, appliance doors and drawers to keep them closed and prevent stuff from falling out. Mount TVs to walls to keep them in place. Use wood instead of sheetrock, bricks, or concrete when building homes, as wood is more flexible and less likely to collapse. Now, if you have the tech or the resources to do so, you could also build homes like how the Incas built their cities. Like It's like a jigsaw but puzzle but with stones. Perfect uh, placement for earthquakes. Um, it lasted for that long with earthquakes, so I'm sure it would work with modern day Anyways, earthquake prep. This will be a list that you of items you may need for an earthquake and the aftermath. Keep in mind this will be this will all be listed per person, and you will need a, enough of it to last at least a week. Non-perishable food, water, gas for car, cash, helmets, boots, clothes, masks. Not for COVID, but for particles like asbestos or ash that may be stirred up from the earthquake. So even if it's not a pandemic, you're still gonna need masks for the other reasons. Um, hygiene products that don't require water, like dry shampoo. Fire is fire extinguishers in case of any fires. Tents or RVs, as you may have to be camping outside for a while. Sleeping bags and pillows to go with that. Flashlights and lanterns. No candles, as there may be leaking gas and you do not want to cause any explosions. Not to mention, aftershocks may knock over candles, mm -hmm. causing fires. Um, batteries for everything that needs batteries. 
spare tires, spare car battery and jumper cables, copy of identification paperwork like ID, birth certificate, social security number, etc. Insurance, proof of insurance, generator, sanitation, gloves, toiletries, feminine products, even if you are not female as pads and tampons can be used for any bleeding, first aid kits, tennis rackets or snowshoes large enough for you to put on your feet in case of quicksand from liquefaction. That would again be part of the distributing the weight and less likely to sink. Chainsaws and axes for any downed trees. Um, for those who have, well, other s uh, survival tips would be, again, repeat it for those with health issues, whether at risk for heart attacks and slash or seizures or will or one of those health issues where you're in for uh, surgeries a lot or need needles a lot, I would suggest avoiding earthquake-prone areas as it could trigger earthquakes and seizures and nobody wants wants to be in the middle of a surgery or have a needle in their arm when, they're, when an earth earthquake hits. That's like death sentence right there. Um, anyways, the only sur survival tip I have for those who would not, uh, for those of you who would, uh, have, for those of you that don't want to go through the efforts to best your chances of, of survival is to simply don't live in earthquake prone areas. Uh, for that map, just go where like the blue areas or the white areas because those are the least likely to have a large earthquake. It's just simple. If you don't want to go through it, just don't live there. Um, and then the Q&A, ask questions if you have any. Since this will be premiered, um, that would be a part two if you guys comment on questions, either in premiere or in um, what you would call it, or in the comment section afterwards. I'll save that stuff to do a question of the day at the, well, like a week from now. So with that, that does seem to be it. Stay safe. This is about 27 minutes long, and I thought it was going to be a lot well, if there's a stream, this is going to be about an hour long, but sadly, Google technical difficulties ruin that. But nonetheless, that does seem to be it. Stay safe. See you in the next video. Bye.